Thank you very much. I feel very welcome here. It's an honor to have you uh, be part of this meeting, for me to be part of this meeting. Thank you very much. Um, can we just start out with a quick poll? How many of you know your gynecologist like other than me? Anyone know? That's excellent. So your gynecologists are finally hitting the map. We've actually become a board certified subspecialty and so there may be one near you and that's going to be handy based on what I tell you. So I thought we would spend a little time together, um, not going into deep medical details, but I want to share with you what I consider a tragedy in women's health. And um, so I have to give you a few of the medical and surgical details, but really, what I really want to tell is the broader story of something that happened that I think should never have happened in our modern medicine. So we'll breeze through some awareness of common pelvic floor disorders. We'll talk about a giant loophole in our regulatory process called the 510K process at the FDA. And this is a process for devices and materials. And then I'm hoping that you'll form an opinion about the balance between medicine, real problems that people have, and marketing for female pelvic floor disorders. So these have been around a long time. I think um, for many years people have complained of pelvic floor disorders, uh, if, if this little statuette is any evidence. The most common pelvic floor disorders are urinary incontinence, stress urinary incontinence, urgency urinary incontinence, those are the two most common forms. Pelvic organ prolapse, which is the most common form of prolapse in women, and bowel control problems such as fecal incontinence. So these are some numbers about how, as our population ages, the number of women who will seek help from a physician for these disorders is going to continue to rise. And you can see that this is more common in women in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And I'll show you the demographics of the 60s, 70s, and 80s in just a moment. So as our population gets older, we're going to see more and more consultations for these disorders. So the light blue is the 60s, the darker blue is the 70s, and the greenish color, depending on your view of that color, is in 80s plus. So you can see here in 2010, um, we didn't have that many consultations in the 70s and 80s, but as our population ages, that would be us aging, uh, we anticipate that more and more women will be seeking um, pelvic floor health consultation. So here's some other ways to look at that. I hope that yellow is projecting adequately. The raw numbers of women affected by female pelvic floor disorders. So this is a disorder where people may be bothered, their life may be impacted. At some point, they cross a threshold where they seek treatment. At some point, they begin to accept treatment and may get deeper into treatment and hopefully have resolution of symptoms or adequate control of their symptoms so they can have a full quality of life. We know that surgery for pelvic organ prolapse and urinary incontinence, stress urinary incontinence, is very common. And this rises as people get older. And the raw numbers per decade of women undergoing surgery continue to rise. Surgery can be very effective treatment for certain types of female pelvic floor disorders. So now I want you just to stare at this slide and put your marketing hat on for just a minute because we're going to wobble between medicine and marketing for just a minute. Wow, look at that market. All these people, right? Let's make something. Let's sell something. Oops. Let's do something. And sure enough, that started percolating. And this is the kind of graph that got those conversations starting. So I talked about urinary incontinence. The two most common kinds are stress urinary incontinence, SUI. This is not stress like I have a lot to do with this meeting. This is the physiologic stress of pressure on a bladder against an insufficient urethral sphincter. It's highly effectively treated with surgery, and surgery has been done for more than 100 years, and the first line surgery is done with a synthetic mesh, a very thin piece of mesh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Urgency urinary incontinence is the kind of incontinence that you see on TV with people with the gotta go, can't get there fast enough, and people take medication for that. And one thing that's important to know is many people have both. So you can take a pill, and if you have stress incontinence, that's not going to help. If you have both and you have surgery, you're still going to have the gotta go kind. It's very, very common to have uh, both disorders. So we have a lot of unhappy bladders, uh, unfortunately. And uh, one of my good friends, uh, um, Ingrid Nygaard, has written about potty parity. Have you ever waited in a long line for the women's bathroom while the men are going in and out, in and out, in and out, right? That's uh, 
potty parity. And, and little by little, there's um, more regulation about the number architecturally and, and city regulations and county regulations, the number of washrooms. It shouldn't be equal. It should be appropriate per gender. So we're working on that. So we began to do some stress incontinence surgery with meshes. And we got these ideas because hernias were being successfully repaired with mesh in general surgery. Never mind the numbers, it just showed that if, if you used a bit of mesh, instead of just sewing tissue, the recurrence rate was lower. Sometimes there was a trade-off with some problems, but by and large, there was a, a, a problem, a, a lower rate of recurrent hernias. And in urogynecology, we began to have success with stress incontinence surgery, people began to think about this for mesh. So you can begin to see the marketing wheels start to turn. Now I'm going to talk with you about a major trial that really sets aside the meshes that were used for stress incontinence surgery and the meshes that are used for prolapse because it's a very important distinction as we go through what we call the pelvic mess of mesh. So this is a front and side view of what pelvic uh, bladder sling surgery looks like. Now when we say bladder sling, we don't actually move the bladder. What we do, if you think of the bladder, if we go back to our unhappy bladder here, at the base of that bladder, we've got this big birthday party balloon on top and then a little knot, just like a birthday party balloon, just at the, where that bladder would be wearing a necktie. And that's where the little sling goes. And what it does is it acts as a backstop to prevent momentary urinary loss. So now you're almost halfway to being a urogynecologist, just a little bit more and you'll be able to sit for the exam. So these are very simple day surgeries that reduce the morbidity associated with probably 100 years and 300 variations of stress incontinence surgery. Stress incontinence surgery is now first line, simple bladder sling or synthetic mesh, mid-urethral sling is the official name, and is highly effective. So this is a large trial uh, funded by the NIH and one of our clinical trials network that compared the two most common forms of mid-urethral sling. And the cure rates aren't 100%, that's important to know. But these two over on the right, you can see kind of a non-inferiority equivalence study uh, showing the estimate and the confidence intervals for the cure rates. And so these two were both effective with low rates of side effect and essentially interchangeable, although at the two-year data, one pulled out ahead just a little bit more. Most of us use that, that particular one. But this form of mesh in female pelvic floor disorders is appropriate and safe. That being said, there are still people who are risk adverse. They don't want anything artificial in their body and they can have their, their um, condition treated as well without mesh. This is really the condition where the market got ahead of things. So these are some pictures of vaginal um, pelvic organ prolapse. So uh, people commonly say, well, my bladder dropped. It's not exactly the bladder dropped. All of us have folded socks that have gone into the laundry and come out inside out or got thrown into the laundry inside out. It's basically an inside out sock that has to be turned back inside and held in place for proper function. This is a disease of women who have born children vaginally. It almost exclusively occurs in those women, although I have had one or two nuns, um, but there's always a story behind that. So this is a disorder of vaginal parous woman. This is something that we should be celebrating on Mother's Day because it's a delayed sign of motherhood along with the other changes that our bodies have, have when, uh, when motherhood comes along. So on the bottom, you can see um, on the bottom left, I don't know if I have a pointer, but um, you can see the uterine prolapse. And even after hysterectomy, the vagina can fall inside out. It's not a uterine problem, it's a vaginal support problem. And so people began to think, well, this is sort of like a hernia. And the marketing people thought, well, if it's sort of like a hernia, and general surgery is using mesh, and mesh gives better results in men's hernias, let's put it in women's vaginas. Now, you'll recognize that there was a big gap between those last two steps. <laughs> and we're going to talk about that gap here. Now, there's been a long-standing operation that's used mesh abdominally with high success rates, usually used for women who have not had success with a prior surgery. It's called a sacrococopexy. We work abdominally. We used to work through open incisions. Now we work through laparoscopic or robotic incisions, the minimally invasive techniques. And we bring that vagina back inside, attach it, and hold it up to a strong ligament in the pelvis. It works very well. 
It's not perfect, but it has high success rates, and it's a gold standard surgery in our field. So the market people are over there thinking, gee, we've got all these women with their vaginas inside out, and they're getting older, and there's going to be more of them, and nobody's making any product. There's no profit anywhere in this market. So they got into the field. They recognized that there's this vast and growing number of patients. They said, if we can put mesh into a hernia spot, we can certainly put into the vagina. They saw that mesh was being used successfully for this bladder sling or mid-urethral sling. And so they went ahead and decided, they, people who market these things for a living, decided to make kits and meshes to place in vaginas. Now, I think I'm not breaking the news here to this group, but uh, hernia and woman's vagina are very different spaces. They have very different life experiences, very different daily events, and um, things may not work quite the same. So let's talk a little bit about this FDA process, which most people aren't familiar with. We talk about the FDA as an understaffed, powerful organization that tries to make sure that we're safe. Mostly we think of it in terms of medications. And we know if you have a new drug, the Be Happy drug, and you want to bring this new drug to market, it's a pretty rigorous process. It has to be placebo studies, et cetera, et cetera, and it's a pretty rigorous process. Until a short time ago, surgical devices and surgical meshes didn't go through that. Basically, they relied on predicate devices. That is, if somebody got through, somebody had a feel-good device, I could come along and say, well, I have a feel-good device that's very much like the one that's already through the system. Now, if it's so much, it's so much the same, it's not clear why we need a second one, but we'll just suspend uh, critique for a moment. And they would say, well, yeah, they do look sort of the same, so we'll let that one through and another one through, and another one through. And you can imagine, now we've got four or five that are all very similar to the predicate device. And the minute they get through that loophole, they're very different. And doctors should use this one rather than this one, right? That's how marketing goes. We all have been through that. Um, I have a general rule, the fancier the brochure, the less the data. And, and that's, uh, I haven't found any um, reason to stop believing that. So the bottom line is, these devices, these materials required absolutely zero new device evidence. No evidence for safety, no evidence for efficacy, and they could be brought to market. Isn't that shocking? Yeah. Now where was this happening in women's pelvic health? I don't know who the first woman was that had one of these implanted. I don't know if she knows who she was, but one day a doctor did this to a patient for the first time. I don't think either the doctor or the patient knew that they were the first patient having this done. That should never, ever have happened. And there were multiple kits, multiple materials that occurred, and multiple women have been harmed. Let's see if I can get my slide to go forward. I may need some help making the slide go forward. I, I think the slide is even upset at that what, what just happened with that patient. <laughs> You're going to advance for me, I hope? That's great. Now, this is an example. I'm not picking on this company in particular. I pick on them all equally. So this, somebody just made up. There was no testing, no nothing. And this comes in a kit with special equipment and all kinds of stuff. And they would take surgeons away for a, a, week or, a weekend or so and train them without requiring them to have any basic knowledge of female pelvic health or this condition. And then a surgeon will go home and put this kind of spider-like thing in somebody's vagina. And guess what? It was a disaster. Kit after kit, mesh after mesh didn't work. So there's generations of these things. One of the ones is this one right in the top of the center called the ob tape. It's not OB tape, it's called obturator because that's the space it went in. And these things work themselves out and cause the patients tremendous difficulty. You can imagine what happened in intimate life um, and, and lots and lots of problems. And just look at these pictures, these horrific side effects that a woman who just wanted a little improvement in her quality of life got. These kind of incredible side effects. And, you know, in the back of the surgical meetings, we'd start saying, you know, I'm seeing this, you've seen this, I'm seeing this, you've seen this. And we realized we had a growing epidemic of surgical disasters on our hands. 
Our field is called reconstructive. We don't take things out, we put things back. And all of a sudden, a third of our practice was removing, trying to get people back to a baseline, trying to get them some help. So these kinds of problems we would see in the vagina where mesh had worked its way into places where it absolutely didn't belong. So uh, my friend Ingrid Nygaard wrote a, a wonderful editorial. She at that time was the president of our Urogynecology Society, American Urogyn Society, and began a process to a voluntary registry that was supported with um, uh, a variety of dollars that the industry um, would allow us to use these reports and supply materials and information to the FDA in a more organized fashion. Before, it was up to a single surgeon to go to the FDA website find the website, fill out the report, right? No, that's just not gonna happen, right? So people after, after three or four of these took about 45 minutes to fill a report, and if a third of your practice is this kind of patient, it's not gonna get reported, it's just not. So, but enough stuff was coming forward from the doctors and from the patients, websites were starting to pop up, that the FDA actually issued a warning about complications that could happen. This put a little bit of chill in the air, but not enough until they did a big systematic review, and in 2011, um, we began to get some very, very serious warnings, kind of uh, black box warnings, essentially, for surgical materials. They talked about the risks. They set these aside from the traditional abdominal surgery that we've had. They talked about the lack of evidence that these techniques or materials improved the outcomes for patients or helped patients in any way. They talked about the problems that this was that these could pose and of course any surgery can have complications any surgeon that doesn't uh, if you're talking to a surgeon who says I've never had a complication you're either talking to a surgeon who hasn't operated yet or Pinocchio I mean it just complications are part of surgery they're part of medicine but we would see unusual forms of complications things that we have never seen I've been practicing this for 30 years I've never seen these kind of complications until this period dyspareunia painful intercourse dreadfully painful intercourse. Young 30, young 40-year-old women whose life would never be the same. We could never get them back to zero after multiple operations. We coined a new term, his perunia. She might be okay, but he would get a penile laceration because of mesh that had worked its way into the vagina. He wasn't happy. Um, additional interventions, multiple surgeries, these were required, so a lot of taking out before we get back to the baseline, and then we could start reconstruction again. Persistent problems that really undermined a woman's self-image, body image, sense of herself sexually, sense of herself as a healthy person. Uh, very, very bad problems over many, many years. So the surgeons uh, received some special instructions from the FDA at these two times, the one in 2008, including giving the patient of the device listing, because one of the things we recognized is some women never even knew they were having this placed. The surgical consent didn't say anything about it. The office chart didn't say anything about it. So the patient's report of, you know, no one told me, was more believable in that situation. We know that patients don't always remember everything we say, but this is a major surgical device, major surgical implant, and we would expect someone to know about it, and patients weren't being told. They were just sort of, it was sort of looked at as a value added, you know, I'll do a little something extra for you here. Um, and uh, in 2011, the FDA reminded the surgeons to tell patients that removal of the mesh can be a problem. So lots and lots of problems. So we actually got some action on behalf of this group of patients. Um, there are things happening in a good way and there are things happening in a little bit of an out of control way. But through the FDA, we were able to close that loophole, that 510 loophole that you could just drive through. Now one of the things I didn't tell you before about that big loophole, which sounds kind of crazy to begin with, didn't it? It just sounded, really? We allow that? You know, I got a feel good thing and you got a feel good thing and because yours is good, mine must be good. It just didn't make any sense. But how about this one? I've got a mesh and oh, well my mesh is kind of like your mesh, so the FDA lets it through. Well, it turns out this one's bad, that goes away, but this one that got through, based on the similarity, gets to stay. Now what's the rationale there? Yeah, I would say that's a little mental lab, so that's what was going on. So the FDA really cranked down, they tightened things, they have specific classes of products. So these kits, that sort of spider kit that I showed you, 
The instrumentation that comes with that was moved from a low risk device, at least into a moderate risk device, so that the kits that the companies were saying, you know, you have to buy this special thing to be able to take care of this patient, that's not going to help people in a global setting like uh, Mr. Christoph talked about. Women in Nepal need help. They have a big problem with this there. We're not going to buy kits and expensive things like this to help globally. And they moved the meshes themselves from class two to class three and required pre-market approvals and post-market surveillance. So it's not as tight as I would like, but it's better than we used to have. The bad thing that's happening is, it, unless you really don't watch TV, you have to have seen the 1-800-BAD-MESH commercial family. Okay. So now what's happened is there are class action suits, class action settlements, you'll see them in this and others, where people who have legitimately been harmed have a mechanism to regain something to help offset the health, health problems that they've been uh, given, which should never have happened. So the companies are, uh, the documents from the companies are starting to come out showing uh, that they knew of these problems but continued to market the devices, um, that they allowed physicians who weren't trained to purchase these or hospitals who had no trained physicians to purchase these. So there's a lot of culpability, but there's also culpability in the medical profession where physicians who want to sort of keep the patient try to do something well beyond the scope of their training practice or expertise. And so you see all these kinds of things. So when you're bored, if you're online now, just Google transvaginal mesh, and you will be shocked at what comes up. So now what does a patient who had something done in 2008 who actually is doing fine? She got lucky. Nothing bad happened to her. She's fine. So now she sees these horrible things, and we call it the worried well. She comes in now and says, well, I want this out. Something might happen. Well, she's actually okay. There's no need to put her through any surgery or anything to have anything put out. So um, it's caused a big commotion for her patients and problems. So I'm glad that I had the opportunity to present this. I hope um, that um, this is something that will never happen again in women's health. Um, a lot of people compare it to what happened with silicone breast implants. Um, I don't want to say one is worse than the other, but if we learned well from silicone breast implants, whether what was right or what was wrong there, we certainly should have handled this better, and this one really got out of control despite our professional society's best efforts. So we really sort of feel that the pelvic female disorders, especially pelvic organ problems, got caught in a perfect storm. And what happens there is if there is something to be learned medically or biologically from these kits, devices, or approaches, it will make it very difficult to study um, because now there's a lot of litigation, a lot of patient fear, a lot of misunderstanding. So if a patient comes in and just has stress incontinence and wants a mid urethral sling that's been proven safe and effective in large, well-studied trials through the NIH, she's afraid of mesh because of this problem and it makes it harder for us to take care of patients like that. So I wanted to share this with you all because I think as women and as physicians or soon to be physicians for the students in the room, it's really our vigilance and our voice that must prevent this kind of thing from ever happening again in women's pelvic health. Thank you very much for your time, attention, I appreciate it.